Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Elizabeth Benefro. I'm the Senior Director of Marketing here at Sorcero, and I'm so happy to be joined today by our Medical Analytics Advisor, Tim. Tim, welcome. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm glad to be here. Great. So I was hoping maybe we can just start out and you could tell me a little bit about your background and experience. Yeah, sure, absolutely. You know, when, when I get asked this question, I think about uh, what are some of the episodes uh, in my life that have shaped my character and have uh, allowed me to pursue the path that I've chosen in my life? And then who are the people that I've met in my life that have also influenced, you know, my interests, my aspirations? Uh, and, uh, you know, I'll, I'll start by telling you that uh, I've always uh, looked forward to what, you know, the future holds, you know, uh, so since being a ch child, you know, uh, growing up in the 80s, thinking about, you know, what would happen in during 2000 in the Cold War, you know, is there going to be this nuclear war? And, you know, I remember going to sleep and thinking about, you know, the social responsibility and, the, you know, what uh, what you know others uh, in my country and in the world would experience in the future and so innovation has uh, has clearly been my you know north star and something that i've always focused on uh, in in my field which has been you know you know the pharmacy pharmaceutical industry and medical affairs for 17 years and uh, you know going back to some episodes that i recently remembered also uh, i i had this recurrent dream you know that I still uh, remember uh, that of, of of driving in the car and uh, having a reading a newspaper with no steering wheel, and uh, having my friends and family in the car. You know, and uh, and it would be a recurring dream that uh, that I, I still remember vividly today. And it's it's the self driving you know car technology, for example, that I've I've also been fascinated with. So. Um, you know, going uh, to, you know, going back to medical affairs and what I'm currently interested in having, uh, after having worked in large companies, small specialty companies that have grown to become the largest uh, in their specialty, uh, going through success and failures, uh, I, I want to help influence other medical affairs leaders colleagues uh, to integrate in the latest technology, to have a forward-looking vision, uh, to, uh, to, to bring some of the best of, from other industries and to integrate decision-making, more rapid decision-making into medical affairs, into the daily uh, you know, activities and the value, you know, express value more clearly. You know, communicate, find ways to to merge data analytics with organizational change. Because I think for far too long we've been uh, approaching metrics and our value in medical affairs as something that's distinct and that's separate from uh, the impact that it has on culture. So I'm measuring and merging, integrating uh, the metrics that we measure using novel technology. Uh, with the impact that it has on culture, because I think no conversation can take place without one or the other in the same sentence, in the same phrase. And that was the reason why I had formed my consulting company seven years ago. I'm a De Pharma, uh, a data analytics and organizational change company. Uh, and so I'm dedicating the rest of my career to help elevate the performance and to clarify and better communicate the value of medical affairs organizations globally, so. Great, no, that, that was a really helpful uh, background you gave there. Now, I know that you have quite a bit of involvement in MAPS. I was wondering if you could tell us what MAPS is and, and your role there. Uh, sure, absolutely, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, MAPS is a, a medical affairs professional society. It's a nonprofit organization that uh, is global and that ultimately creates a lot of continuous learning and development content uh, and also connects people from all around the world in order to understand what are some of the best practices of uh, various different functions in this growing uh, organization and growing function of medical affairs. 
Uh, and so it's been tremendously fulfilling for me personally uh, to be able to be a part of the organization and to also chair their global mentorship uh, program, which I was given the opportunity to, uh, to do by uh, their board and uh, their leadership who happen to also be my mentors and who have uh, played a big role in my career as well and the path that I took uh, having started in medical education and publications and then uh, working my way in medical affairs, training teams, uh, you know, within the field medical function. Uh, and so I had approached them to be an interview, be a guest on my podcast, on my All Out Coach podcast. And they told me, look, why don't you uh, actually start our global mentorship program? And so it's been a tremendously fulfilling experience for me because I'm able to help uh, a lot of the competitive companies in this field, you know, in medical, in, in pharma, in the pharmaceutical industry, in medical devices, in biotech, uh, in, 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 to actually collaborate, to actually learn from each other, to train each other, to mentor each other, and to recruit some of the best talent as well. Uh, because I think the best investments that we make in life are in ourselves and in other people. Yeah. And so I'm also part of the membership committee um, leadership committee there and also um, a member of their uh, external education or the medical education functional area working group that has allowed me to continue to learn continue to educate uh, about some of the latest novel formats of medical education and and how it's delivered uh, so it's it's a society that I would uh, recommend anyone, anyone interested in life sciences, in healthcare, and as somebody who's as, who aspires to be in the pharmaceutical industry and to make a to make a difference in the patients' lives. Um, this is a uh, society that that generates a lot of evidence and that connects, and we're connects uh, this close knit community uh, of medical affairs professionals globally. Well, it, it certainly sounds like you're helping out a lot with them. And we also appreciate the advising that you're doing for us. So I was curious, what was it about Sorcero that piqued your interest? Yes, so uh, Sorcero is a company that has uh, changed my mind, changed my mind about what innovation and what technology really is, Elizabeth, I can tell you, because uh, for, I first got to know about Sorcero in 2020 after I wrote a LinkedIn article, a very comprehensive, very long article on medical affairs metrics, uh, and uh, where I addressed a lot of the issues head on for this age old question that has not been solved. Um, yet I think that needs to be uh, because uh, metrics and uh, our performance uh, and how it's measured is integral to our engagement also into our culture and to how we collaborate and communicate with each other uh, and so uh, Sorcero changed my mind in in terms of understanding that technology can actually make us smarter which I didn't think before I didn't think before was the case I always thought that uh, you know that technology uh, does not make us more intelligent it increases our exposure but uh, because of Sor Sorcero and its approach to, 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 to actually to integrating uh, technology, some of the most advanced artificial intelligence with human intelligence, and because of how it defines the fact that uh, our artif the sum of artificial and human intelligence is greater than either one alone, uh, I think that it has changed my approach and 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 really made me realize that uh, you by in order in order to uh, be able to uh, apply a lot of the data that is out there and uh, and to make better decisions stronger decisions more evidence based decisions you have to organize that that data and once you can organize a lot of the information better um, you're left with more time to to make the decisions using your own human intelligence and so ultimately i think uh, i've changed my opinions and it uh, you know about the role of 
technology, artificial intelligence combined with machine learning in truly extending the potential of uh, making more evidence-based uh, decisions. Uh, in this well, in this world in which we we have a lot of data at our disposal, right, and in which uh, most of the advanced technology that we see out there uh, attracts our attention and it constantly stimulates our attention and it uh, shifts it as well instantly, instantaneously. Where and, and it does so by these external factors external variables that are not always uh, voluntary or organic to us. Uh, and, and so ultimately what that does is that favors micro learning, so learning in bite-sized information, but that does not ensure the consolidation of the memory or, the, or our actual application of all of this data that we're exposed to. And so Sorcero recognizes that and it facilitates uh, that decision, that data-driven decision-making for many medical, medical affairs organizations, for uh, healthcare professionals at various levels of their career, uh, researchers who are doing, uh, who are actually uh, conducting novel studies, decentralized studies, who have to very quickly ensure that all this growing body of evidence can prevent medica medication errors, medical errors, and can be compliant with uh, com regulation uh, as well. And so I think what, what we have done in medical affairs for far too long is we've uh, generated evidence, but we've generated it, it you know, episodically. And we've regarded um, education, medical education, medical affairs as episodes. Oh, we need to demonstrate. We need to uh, demonstrate more evidence in this for this patient population, uh, rather than be able to adapt to it uh, in real time. In, in real time, and and, and uh, essentially, uh, Sorcero has changed my view of the continuous. Uh, the continuity of education and the capabilities out there from the technology to apply uh, all of that, all of those changes, all of the, those updates, the, the information it, via different formats, which are difficult to gather, you know, uh, and and make better decisions, make stronger, more true, truly evidence-based decisions. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so I think you've already kind of hit on this to some degree, but um, what would you say are the major pain points that are faced by medical affairs teams? So medical affairs teams are now uh, faced with the reality of uh, the fact that uh, data is abundant, that information is traveling faster than ever. Uh, and so they're recognizing the need to describe reality uh, more accurately than, th than they have been. And I think that's a sign of strongest leadership, strongest leaders. Uh, the, you know, as Edwin Friedman said, the strongest leader is the, who emerges is the one who's able to describe reality most accurately. And so uh, I think that medical affairs organizations are now you know, at you know, at a, a turning point where they are, they, they have been in a, uh, in this, in, involved in uh, a shift in the, their regulatory policies where there was this firewall between, very, very strong firewall between medical affairs and, and the commercial organization for, for many years, right? Since the early 2000s, because of difficult, because of particular episodes of uh, products that were recalled uh, after they came onto the market um, uh, uh, for various safety reasons. And actually those were one of the reasons why I personally uh, in, started my career in the pharmaceutical industry. And so now, however, because of that data, because of all the different formats of data uh, that are needed for medical affairs to build their strategy, to create new publications, to de develop medical education, or to, to sponsor medical education and to grow the awareness of particular um, patient uh, patients and patient conditions for which there hasn't been a lot of attention or resources, mm. they, they, they realize that that firewall between uh, medical affairs and commercial and marketing is now 
been blurred. Mm -hmm. And also there's they're demanded, they're being demanded to demonstrate their value in more concrete terms. And so they're they're struggling with how they're applying uh, various different uh, tools, technology, uh, in order to uh, to be relevant, to stay competitive and stay relevant, because medical affairs at the end of the day uh, does impacts patients' lives and creates you know conducts different clinical studies, uh, transforms strategy that of, often. Uh, you know, in, encompasses many different functions and has wide-reaching potential, but nevertheless, it doesn't directly generate revenue. And so, the me the discussion that uh, often takes place within medical affairs the, uh, teams is is uh, how how do do they continue to be seated at the table where the most important decisions take place? Because of the because of the background and the training that they have, uh, that a lot of medical affairs professionals they they are they need to be uh, their voice needs to be heard and it it's it's a constant you know uphill climb you know and and particularly in an era in a time where a lot of the doctoral uh, grad graduate level uh, medical affairs professionals they uh, they realize that clinical trials you know for various conditions uh for in, in which symptoms are being measured that are subjective for example uh, a ckd chron chronic kidney disease related itch for example associated itch they are also their subjective measures yet they need to be quantified mm -hmm. in, in clinical trials right so in a similar way that clinical trials usually use metrics they they need they need to utilize data and they are there is a uh, a movement that i think i'm very encouraged by by many innovative companies that are now employing advanced analytics that are changing the structure of their medical affairs organizations they have evidence generation uh, departments patient centric centric patient centricity is at the top of many of uh, medical affairs uh, professionals and teams' minds. In fact, there is a company that requires 1% of every uh, medical affairs individual team member's time to be spent with patients directly. Uh, how, they're, uh, how quickly they're turning around studies is changing as well, uh, because real world evidence is now being demanded. Right, where they have to uh, create solutions for the patient journey. And in order for the patients to have equal access or equity to the medications, uh, they, they have to be studied first in an investigational manner uh, before they can be translated into clinical practice. And in order to delay that, you know, those months and years, which could mean difference of lives for many patients, a lot of the medical affairs uh, teams are now generating more evidence more quickly, and that's the uh, that's the practical you know uh, you know uh, value of integrating data and uh, and and it, rather than falling behind, which medical affairs teams have have done in the past, uh, they've fallen behind in adapting new technology. Uh, compared, relatively speaking, compared to let's say R and D clinical development, marketing, and commercial. Other functions that many more people are familiar with. Uh, and so that's one of the other change that I hope to, to be able to influence by partnering with Sorcera. Yeah, so actually you bring up a great point. Why do you think it is that um, some of those other areas have adopted technology so much quicker than medical affairs you know how, what what can we do to help remedy some of the pain points that you just mentioned that the medical affairs teams have uh, so there are various different uh, uh, you know factors i think and variables that uh, that you can uh, hypothesize to to that change uh, usually medical affairs teams are smaller much smaller than the other functions. Uh, and so they do not have operations departments. They usually do not outsource as much of their information. If you look at some benchmark analyses. And so medical affairs teams have uh, traditionally tried to do more with less. 
but because of how quickly the computing processing power has increased exponentially to the point where uh, you know the, the 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 data that we are exposed to every day can leave many people confused and also fatigued over time uh, you know now you know the organization and the operational aspects of medical affairs are becoming much more evident and much more de- needed than ever before because uh, you've had operations departments and you know and these positions right chief operating pr- uh, officer of commercial organizations traditionally before you didn't have those positions in medical affairs until recently because now we're realizing that we need to pay attention to what we pay attention to and not just pay attention and not just to measure what what technology uh, attracts our attention to but what that technology uh, allows us to uh, point uh, to explain our deep understanding of the context so it shifts the focus from uh, from attracting our attention and all of our key stakeholders patients physicians uh, healthcare professionals policymakers to the context so what how can we uh, integrate the human and artificial intelligence in order to make more evidence based decisions in order to uh, create more publications uh, in in more rapidly utilizing various different platforms and n- not just knowledge acquisition but shifting our you know focus from uh, from knowledge to deep understanding Mm-hmm. And, and and intelligence language intelligence because uh, I think that you know words and numbers also uh, they 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 are they they are the details that often matter you know in healthcare decisions uh, you know pictures are important and and we've relied on pictures for far too long and you know uh, and pictures may tell a story but numbers can tell its ending you know often and so um i think that some of the i think that the there's various different uh areas of medical affairs in which in which they can create more uh engagement you know more uh, str- more streamlined strategy and uh, a more clear value proposition that they can communicate across different functions because there are a number of studies that have shown that uh, the team members of medical affairs teams uh, they, they they're passionate and they're uh, they're happy about what they're doing uh, from a day-to-day basis but they they do not remember or they do not know how to relate what you know how they are being how their their insights are being measured or who or what happens to those insights those invaluable insights that they bring in because of their training because of their uh, healthcare professional and doctor level training and so uh, that's you know uh, so that has been one of the pain points that now that that is 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 evident for those people who have been in this uh, in medical affairs organizations for many years and who've seen how it has evolved and how unfortunately the 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 culture has changed on these teams where you see medical affairs professionals changing companies uh, you know every year every two years mm. you know which uh, begs the question of what is how do you evaluate that training that goes into you know in the time that goes into uh, hiring someone and then bringing them you know to up to speed before they end up taking all that talent somewhere else Mm. So it has far-reaching implications um, in terms of the operations, the value, and the the engagement. Uh, all of which I think technology and metrics and data can play an important role. With again social responsibility, with understanding what is the ultimate context and impact of those decisions, which Sorcero is uh, has been a leader in in my mind. Great. Well, so you talked a bit about the evolution of medical affairs. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm curious, where do you see the medical affairs profession in, let's say, five years from now? 
Uh, yeah, I wish I had the crystal ball. <laughs> uh, uh, otherwise, I, I, I may be developing some of the technology, some of the novel apps myself, Elizabeth. Um, but I, I'll tell you that uh, I think that you, you've seen uh, probably most recently uh, a lot of healthcare professionals reporting a lot of fatigue uh, over the during the pandemic. So uh, one trend that I've observed is a lot of practicing uh, successful clinicians, investigators, physicians who are now moving uh, from their clinical uh, jobs to industry, which I think can empower uh, uh, the medical affairs uh, organizations you know, overall. Uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, physicians, um, thought leaders, experts, scientific experts now take very senior executive roles in medical affairs. So what that is going to mean is uh, more patient centricity, more data transparency, uh, and again, more value-based care, um, where the, the, the success of medical affairs or organizations and their assets and you know their the products is going to depend on not just um, the let's say the the fee fee for service or its attributes, but ultimately the patient outcomes. Right. You know, and and the, that uh, the data communication and the evidence generation will have will probably accelerate. You know, and there, uh, in terms of what is going to be regarded as a standard endpoint in clinical trials, that's those are uh, that's going to change. Uh, there is an there's an increase in the digital health and digital therapeutics now. You know, where the funding uh, was uh, over $5 billion last year, just half, the second half of last year, and it's only increasing. And you see a lot of companies such as Otsuka, Eli Lilly partner, and also acquire a lot of digital therapeutic uh, uh, option, uh, you know, uh, digital therapeutic companies. Uh, where I think medical affairs companies are going to understand uh, and they're going to have to redefine what competition is and they're going to have to maybe reimagine co-opetition uh, in, in, in expanding their pipelines of medications and also looking outside of the traditional conventional therapeutics into digital therapeutics, for example, which have a lot of uh, important data now behind them. Uh, pair therapeutics and substance abuse and mental health and diabetes, a lot of chronic conditions and respiratory conditions as well. Uh, anchoring, I think, also direct impact on uh, patient outcomes by ecosystem is the other, the third change that I, I foresee, where uh, the geographic differences um, and particular patient uh, patient profiles uh, are going to uh, be important in in, uh, in building the strategy of medical affairs companies. You see a lot more. Uh, roles now than you did before, and you'll probably see even more in the future of medical affairs uh, employees who are now responsible for their territory, not from just the medical perspective, but from partnering along with market access with commercial mm -hmm. uh, in order to bring uh, bring increased patient increased access to patient care and to improve outcomes ultimately. Because, you know, medical affairs essentially is in the business of information. We're all in the business, we're in the age of information and in the pharmaceutical industry, I think we, are, we work in the business of information and in communicating information, which means that we help healthcare professionals identify suitable patients, uh, suitable patients for particular products. And and so too the commercial our commercial counterparts right sales reps market access marketing they help healthcare professionals get access to the medications that they need mm -hmm. for patients and so ultimately we converge and i think this is in, in, inevitable to understand that uh, that medical affairs 
uh, organizations are now going to be seen as primary partners for uh, cross functionally and hopefully they'll they'll have they'll increase their budget they'll increase their op operations resource uh, operations activities their their outsourcing as well because the number just the number and uh, types of customers have has increased and will continue to increase where patients now demand tr m treatment much more than they ever did before so whereas before you you used to see um, the direct to consumer uh, commercials on tv alone i think that you will see more medical affairs directed patient education as well i hope to see that more where uh, we are able to uh, to positively influence medical education in order to also to prevent the misinformation that takes place that sarcero also is very co very cognizant of you know because a, a lot of the uh, medical information and education that takes place online is not led by board certified physicians or healthcare professionals but it's these conversations are moderated by patients themselves you know their studies uh, dermatology hashtag study that showed only five percent of all dermatology related hashtags were uh, authored by board certified <laughs> dermatologists and so medical affairs is going to have to enter the conversation and validate the information in various different ways yeah uh and you know there is a recent article in 2017 that asked physicians about you know about whether or not they made a treatment or a procedure decision that they didn't believe was right. And 80% of them said that they did. And, and in fact, uh, those those 80% said, when asked further why, they, they said that they did that in, in, for fear of being sued. And then the second most likely response was 59% of them uh, responded, stated that they uh, they uh, did not prescribe the the right treatment or procedure because because the, their patients demanded them. So patients are going to become much more demanding, and medical affairs teams are going to have to react as well. So expanding, diversifying stakeholders, understanding that you know the uh, in the future the patients will be important stakeholders. Uh, embracing digital digital uh, capabilities uh, through agility and again through social responsibility mm -hmm. um, being able to tell stories through data generate real world clinical and economic data and uh, ultimately uh, merge and integrate new value demonstrating metrics with organizational behavior with culture in order to have strong teams that continue to collaborate and break the and change the conventional norms of communication and collaboration. That's, that's well said. Uh, I really appreciate all of your insight today. And I know that uh, we really appreciate you as an advisor to Sorcero. So thank you so much for taking the time. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. I really enjoyed this conversation with you. Likewise. Thank you. Thanks.